I am Vinny Todorich, folks. Your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean, guaranteed, just like the guy on the other mic. He's been on this show several times before. I talk about him all the time because he's the best reference when it comes to zone two training. Um, he, I used to, I'm a real fan of this guy. This guy's a real hero. Uh, he did something that no one else has ever been able to do in the world of triathlon. You're going to want to pay attention to this because uh, this is going to help all of you do a lot better in life. I'm talking about the great Mark Allen. How are you doing, buddy? Hey, great to see you again, Vinny. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate you coming on. You know, I, it's funny when you move around, I, well, you hadn't been on in a few years. And, you know, I kept typing into my Google machine, not Google, but my um, my emails to find your email and it wouldn't come up. Right. Mm. I was like, why is Mark? I, we've had him on the show three, four times. Is He should come right up. It doesn't come up. So I had Phil, Phil Maffetone on the other day. And I said, Phil, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I've lost Mark's email. And I've been trying to get the guy on the show forever. And uh, so he reconnected us and I'm glad he did. So um, let's brag about you for a moment so that people can actually know who they're talking to. Um, you were doing Iron Man when Iron Man wasn't cool. Is that is that a safe assumption? Well, I, I always thought Iron Man was cool, but it certainly wasn't known. Let's put it that way. You know, like when I first started competing in the early 1980s, you know, you, you'd be on an airplane and you'd go, you know, somebody, well, what do you do? And I go, well, I'm a triathlete. And they'd look at me like it was a foreign word, you know, and I go, well, you know, like Iron Man. And they go, Oh, yeah, I think I've heard of that, you know, and you'd explain it. And then they'd be like, wow, you know, they'd look at you like the dude should probably be in a straight jacket thinking of doing that kind of stuff. And then, you know, then it evolved into like, oh, yeah, Iron Man, you know, I've got a I've got an uncle that did that a year or two ago. And then and then it just got to the point where it's like, you know, people know what triathlon is. People know what Iron Man is. Um, so it, the, 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 the other side of that, though, is that it's sort of been normalized a little bit like. You know, in the beginning, it was like this, wow, a human being can do that, you know, a 2.4 yeah. mile, 12 mile bike marathon. And now it's kind of like, oh, yeah, I've done seven of those or I've done 23 of those or, you know, um, it, it's it's sort of like become a little more commonplace. But, you know, the experience is still the same when you go out there and, and you you cover that distance. And, and we were speaking a little bit about this just before the show started it's one of those things like you can't purchase that experience. You know, you can purchase a movie ticket and go see an amazing movie. You can purchase a concert ticket and see an amazing performer, but uh, you can't buy your way from the start line to the finish line. You have to earn that. And it's it, it's an incredible distance. It takes a lot of training to do it in a way where the experience is positive and you're not falling apart at the end of it. And And it takes a lot of patience. And that's, you know, talking about the zone two thing, that's that was sort of my mantra. You know, in the beginning, when I started out, I was one of those athletes that just hit it hard all the time because I just thought, well, that's what you do. And right away, I saw that if you do that, Mr. Mark Allen, you're going to end up completely burned out, injured, not motivated, you know, and, and you're going to hate this sport. And fortunately, Phil Maffetone, who you were speaking about, was doing some landmark heart rate uh, training uh, research and you know, method methodology back then. And, and we connected, somebody connected us. And he's like, you got to, you got to slow it down. You got to work on that aerobic system, that fat burning system. It's, and he explained it to me, you know, it's, it's low stress on your body. It's the physiology that human beings are set up to develop the most. And then once you have that real core base aerobic fat burning fitness developed, then you can sort of take that big engine that you have and fine tune it with with some anaerobic work, with some speed work, with, you know, making sure that you do strength work and, and activate all of the physiologies that we have. And it, 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 it was hard to do because I had to let my training partners go. They're still like trying to be the winner every day. And I'm like, no, I, I want to win the race. I don't care if you guys beat me today. And, uh, in the end, that was, that was what enabled me to stay healthy and keep progressing through 15 years of a career. Yeah, you know, I, I had that same kind of thing happen when I was doing ultra cycling. <clears throat> People would come, sometimes guys would come in from, you know, Europe and they want to come to Southern California and they look you up because they, they heard about you and the whole thing. And I'd go, I'd go out for training rides with them and we would take off from Calabasas. And before long, they're 
they're pulling away from me and they'll look back and go, well, I thought this guy was a stud. I thought this guy was the guy. They, I, I've been reading about this guy. He's, he's the guy, right? And they'd come back and go, hey, everything okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. And then they would roll away again, you know, pull away from me again. And by the second or third time, they would always go, are you feeling good today? Everything all right? I'm like, yeah. Like, what, light training day for you? I went, no, this, this is how I train. This is it. And nobody, and Mark, I'm sure you have the same experience. Nobody wanted to believe it. Mm. I would always say the volume is in the amount of time I'm spending on a bike, building up capillaries, building up my heart, building up mitochondria. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's where the, you know, I'm building up. I, I called it, you guys are acting like a Ferrari. You know, you're going at 9,000, 10,000 RPMs to get some horsepower. My horsepower is going to happen like a diesel engine. It's going to be long, big strokes. So you can either do it this way or you can do it that way, right? And it was just hard to explain that to people. No one wanted to buy into it. Mm -hmm. That experience? Well, and, you know, it just, it kind of makes sense to me. Like, if you look back and it's been explained to me this way, like, you know, back in, back in ancient times, the only time that you were sprinting was to get away from danger, basically, you know, like when it's saber tooth tigers looking at you like your lunch, you know, you want to run back to the cave as fast as you can, you got to get that high octane carbohydrate fuel going, you don't want that slow diesel engine, you know, you got to get out of there. But, you know, like looking, looking inside a human body, you have enough fat stored in there to go about 500 miles, if you could burn it all at, at once, you've only got enough carbs stored up to go 20 miles. And so clearly, if you just look at that ratio, uh, human beings are meant to do things a little more steady. Of course, when you are competing at a high level, you are activating a lot of that fight or flight stuff and you need to train it so that you can use it in the race. But th the core of the core of all fitness, and especially if you're talking about, you know, lifetime health comes from just that more steady state stuff, a along with, of course, you know, activating your muscles, you know, I mean, if you look at very traditional cultures, um, you know, they, they walked three or four miles a day, you know, looking back on stuff, they, they they carried loads of stuff, they carried wood for the fire, they carried, you know, jugs of water from the spring back to the village. So they were doing their strength work, but it was, it was very intermittent. And it was, it was short, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't three hours in the gym every day, you know, it wasn't <clears throat> a lot of the stuff that we do nowadays, it wasn't super high intensity stuff. Like <clears throat> if you go into a very traditional village, which I have and seen um, very, you know, cultures that have, 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 have uh, people that live to be 90, 100, 110 years old, nobody's doing wind sprints up the hillside. Right. You know, and so I sort of tried to model that in my training that came through Phil and it, it really... That was a secret sauce. Yeah, I, <laughs> you and I are on the same page with that. You know, I always talk about, you know, the Romans when they were conquering the world. You know, they moved these armies 30 miles a day, mostly on foot. Mm. And most of these guys weighed 130, 140 pounds, and they were carrying that much in, in, in weight, you know, with all the stuff that they were carrying to battle whenever they got to somewhere, mm. right? And this was going on day in and day out. Now we, we get all impressed when we go out and run a marathon in mm -hmm. lightweight clothing. Tell someone to carry all the gear those Romans carry. They, they wouldn't do it, right? They, they right. have your little shorts on, your, your lightweight shoes and barely a shirt. You know, it, it's crazy what we think is cool nowadays. And this is what people did every day. As a matter of fact, when I moved to the East Coast, one day I was leaving. I have a, you can see I have a gym right behind me. I have a gym in my office. And I have aerobic equipment over here. I have rowing machines and bikes and everything else. And I have everything right here. But I also go to the gym in town because if I just stay in my office, I, I become a hermit, right? Mm -hmm. I was leaving my house to go to the gym to get on a treadmill. And I walked past the guy cutting my grass. And that's all I could think about on the way to the gym. It's like, wait a minute. I'm paying that guy money to cut my grass. I'm paying another guy money to go lift heavy objects in his gym. <laughs> I'm paying two people. <clears throat> I came home that day and fired the yard guy. Mm -hmm. I came, I came right. Yeah. i worked out. I came home. I, that's all I could think about the entire time I was working out. I told the guy, I said, look, you're doing a great job and everything. I want to start cutting my own grass. I said, don't go very far. Probably won't do it for, for long. I've been doing it for two years now. Mm. Right. I still go to the gym, but I'm cutting my own grass. I mm -hmm. chop my own wood. I could go get once a year, 
I can go get that that big hydraulic thing to split all the wood, or or I can buy an axe, which is what I did. I I just go there and chop wood. I mm -hmm. see people at the gym taking ropes and jiggling ropes, and do, it's like <laughs> we don't have longshoremen anymore. So we got people going crazy jiggling ropes in the gym. Right, all the stuff we used to do, we don't do anymore. That, there's an exercise I do in my yard. Former, they call them former carries because farmers used to carry heavy shit. Mm -hmm. I now take a big giant bar, a hex bar that goes around my body. I lift it up, walk up around my yard. We're going crazy trying to stay somewhat similar to what we were at one time. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, you know, uh, fitness, longevity, health used to be a, a byproduct of living. But as, you know, our world has become more sedentary and jobs have become more intellectual because machines are doing all the physical stuff. We have to actually take time out of our day to to make sure that we're doing the stuff that keeps us healthy, keeps us living long, keeps our brains functioning right, keeps our muscles and tendons and joints and ligaments all strong and keeps us flexible and keeps us able to get up out of a chair without having to pull ourselves up with a bar on the side of the wall. And um, yeah, so you know, it's funny because I just there was an ad on something that I saw just yesterday, literally. And it's this guy in this blank building type thing that's overlooking. He's up. He's up like a, a gazillion stories. And he's got it's a it's a static photo. And he's got those heavy ropes and he's doing his thing, you know, and the guy's like muscular. And I'm thinking, this is what we have become. We've yeah. got to do this thing with ropes. And that's going to like wow, I had a great heavy rope workout today. <laughs> yeah, you know, and like you said, it's like, hmm, maybe there's ways that I can get this without having to actually have it be a, a segmented part of my life. Not that there's anything wrong with that if you like doing it, but a lot of people find it very challenging to actually find the time to actually go out and do that stuff. And so, you know, like I'm 65 now, I've got my Medicare cards, you know, so, right. but I don't want to have to use them. I do not want to have to use them. And so, um, you know, and, and clearly I'm not going to be running an Ironman in eight hours like I did when I was, you know, 100 years ago. And so I've kind of been looking at like, how do you, what do you do as you get older? You know, I mean, you'll, we, all of us will re reach a point where we will be less strong than we were at the peak of our physical physicality. We will right. be slower. We won't have the same endurance. We probably won't have a lot of the things. So what's the goal? And for me, I've realized that the goal and the strategy is to just be as consistent as I can, you know, day in and day out, just move, get out there, move, kind of have like a, a baseline of aerobic activity that I want to do each day, a baseline of kind of how many calories I want to try to burn through exercise, kind of have a baseline of, you know, what, how many days a week am I going to try to do something that is more like physically strengthening my muscles you know how many how many days a week will i actually get get down and do a little bit of stretching and some core and all that kind of stuff and and so i i mix it up now uh, there's no two days that look the same you know i surf a lot which is it's cardio it's a little bit of speed work it's it's stress relief because it's time in nature it's time with community because you're out there with folks that you get to know and it, you know it's it's this whole you know social oh. thing too so it, it, you know and it's play I mean, if we can have our if we can have our movement or exercise, that vitality thing be part play, then it also makes it a lot easier. You know, you and I are very similar in that way. Um, I I don't train for anything in particular anymore. You know, I'm not doing any sport. And, you know, I'm getting ready to go. I'm coming back to California next week and it'll be I'm going to be on Mount Whitney for 11 days hmm. and living in a tent because I like being in nature. I love that feeling, being at altitude, getting getting some of that hematocrit level up again, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, climbing the mountain several times, you know, it's real slushy and horrible up there this year. So who knows what's going to happen. Um, but I put that in front of me every year, you know, we, we'll go to Mont Blanc, I have a climbing partner, and we go here, we go there, we go everywhere, we put something in front of us, because I'm not training for any ultras, I'm not doing any 500 mile nonstop races, I'm not doing anything. But the one thing I put on my calendar every year, and I still have a paper calendar right in front of me on the desk. <laughs> I have to do minimum 365 hours of aerobics per year. Hmm. And I know I'm not going to do it every day because I have to, you know, I like to go to the gym and pump iron. I like to go do other things, right? But I have to get that 365 hours in. So it can be three hours on Saturday. It could be in a kayak. It could be in a rowboat. It could be 
in anything. It could be running, it could be mountain climbing, it could be anything. But every year that I put that 365 as one of my New Year's resolutions, I always went, I've been ending up at 450, 475. So I'm getting that plus. It's not like I get to that number and go, okay, it's July, it's it's <laughs> August, I'm done. I've gotten all my, then you have to make a new goal, right? Yeah. You have to keep putting something in front of yourself or what are you doing, right? It's like, what are we doing? Because it has gotten too easy. We mm -hmm. all have big, Mark, you and I are similar to the same age. I'm going to be 61. When I was a kid, no one sat inside and watched television because they were that big, right? Mm -hmm. it, you know, it wasn't, if it was wide world of sports, yeah, we were there. If it was football, it, we were there. Baseball, what have you. But no one sat around and and with this thing, you know, just, you know, with the thumbs, you know, death scroll. I refuse to do this stuff because I think this is ruining kids. I think it's ruining adults. I see adults. Have you noticed this in California? You go around. You're still in California, Mark? Yeah, Santa Cruz. You go around, you could be standing in line anywhere. You could be online at the bank. You could be online at the post office, wherever people are online, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody just pulls this out, right? I feel, I used to feel like an idiot because mine is in the car, right? And it's like, oh, what am I missing? And then I realized, oh, wait, I'm better than them because mine is in the car. <laughs> you ever get that feeling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the absolute classic is, you know, if you're... um if when you're in the airport and you're waiting for a plane and you look around, it's like there's, you know, 200 people that are getting on the flight and there's three of them that are talking and the rest are yeah. on, the, on that phone. And uh, and, and I, I've actually talked to I've I've written some stuff about this. Uh, and it's this in my mind, it's a concept of as this relates athletically, you know, as you know, uh, you know, you train, you work out, and then it's when you recover that you gain the benefit from that exercise, right? You know, your muscles get stronger, you rebuild, or you, you repair, you replenish. Part of what has to be replenished at the end of the day is your brain. But I think that that phone is interfering with recovery because what are you doing on the phone? You're scrolling through stuff. It's like it's like mental crack, right? You're there's an amazing picture. There's a post. There's a thing you're reading. It's like you know this this high high stimulation thing that's going on. So even though you might be laying on the couch, you're not working out, and you think you're recovering. Your brain is still on high alert. Your brain is still on high activity mode. And the only time that it, a lot of people actually slow it down and shut it down is when they do completely go to sleep. And so I I purposely try to have a lot of periods throughout the day where I am off my electric stuff. Yeah. I'm not on my computer. I'm not on my phone. I go outside. I go for a walk and I just look around and I, I just let my mind be quiet. You know, it's if if you it's nighttime and you're trying to wind down and, and you know, you're trying to go to sleep. <clears throat> I, I tell people, pull out a real book. You know, when you're reading a book, first of all, there's no there's no light. Right. It's not right. it's um impacting you like a screen but secondly when you're when you're actually reading on a page yeah you're reading you're using your mind but at the same time it's it's sort of dreamy like you're creating in your mind the whole story and the scene of what it is that you're reading and so it it, it really is shifting you into more of a kind of a, a, a relaxed state than if you're you know scrolling through a social media thing or whatever so yeah i think it's i think it's interrupting with a lot uh, interrupting a lot of sort of natural processes that are important for a human being to go through in their cycles throughout the day. I did a thing because, um, and Phil got me doing this the other day. <clears throat> I love listening to whole albums. We grew up listening to entire albums, but because of the phone, I've gotten away from it because, you know, we have Pandora and Stitcher mm -hmm. and everything else. So I might put on the Led Zeppelin station, right? And they'll play a bunch of Led Zeppelin songs and then go into other songs like that. Mm -hmm. Although I do have certain albums I'll listen to, there's certain Cat Stevens albums I'll listen to beginning to end. And um, uh, people like um, Joni Mitchell, you know, I have these landmark albums, and you know, I'll just listen to the whole thing. But more and more, I've been getting away from that. And I was talking to Phil the other day, and he was like, go back to listening to albums. So for the past week, I've been, you know, whenever I go on to my Pandora, I scroll through and go, okay, I'm gonna listen to Led Zeppelin 4. I'm not gonna listen to Led Zeppelin Station. <laughs> and it almost, you know, I think Marcel Proust talked about this a lot, where it just transports you back to a mm -hmm. moment in time when you were a kid, mm -hmm. right? or when you when you first learned of that album, or whatever it is, but it does something to your brain. And I think you're absolutely right about what you're saying. You talked about the light, but what I've learned about screens, 
is that is strobing all the time. And if you have that strobing happening, you people can't sleep. I I work on my phone. I work on computers. That's all I do. My my whole job is being on a screen. Mm -hmm. And I started hearing about this screen time being close to eight hours a day of screen time of people in America, just on the phone, by the way, the phone. Eight. So I was like, geez, I work on my phone. I, I earn my living based on this. Right. So I checked my phone. I was under three hours average per week per day. Oh, that, that's pretty good. And that's what and all so you see, but you see, for me, it's work when I'm not working. You know, nobody goes to work after you go away from work, right? It's like, hey, it's five o'clock, we're going home. When I don't have to have this in my hand. I don't I'm not on TikTok. I haven't been on Facebook in years. I don't even know what goes on over there. You know, I give stuff to my assistant to put on my it looks like I'm on the phone all day. But the only thing I'm doing is answering questions. And then I go away again, I'm done, mm -hmm. right? Because at 61 years old, or I'm going to be 61. I don't want any of this controlling my life to the point where I said this to my wife last year, and she still brings this up at dinner parties. And I try to explain and everyone at the dinner parties laugh and they get a good kick out of it. I keep saying, I'm going to go in my backyard a couple of times a year, set up a tent and just live in the tent in my backyard for a week here and there. And everyone laughs because you have this beautiful home. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? It's like, so well, think of it. Every year I go camping, I go hiking, I go camping, I climb mountains, and I'm, I'm in a tent. I enjoy myself. Mm -hmm. I'm happy. I'm relaxed. There's no electronics. There's no television. There's no big screen. There's no nothing. Why do I have to travel thousands of miles to do that? Why can't I just walk into my and they go, well, the first thing everyone brings up, Mark, what happens when you need to take a shit? <laughs> I have a house. I can walk inside, take a dump, and then walk back outside again. And just mm -hmm. be out there. Yeah, okay. I'll 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 come in and take a dump. Okay, big deal. Big deal. Mm -hmm. I don't want to crap all over my yard. That yard is for my dog to crap in. <laughs> right? But everyone laughs and they get a big kick out of it because I just want to do that. I just want to be on the ground. Mm -hmm. And if that sounds weird, call me crazy. But I mean, you ever get those kind of feelings that why don't we just do some of this stuff? Yeah, you know, that's one reason that I surf because it's it's like this very um it's very it's a very intimate interaction with nature and, and it, you know and i will actually do that in my yard it's I, I live in a city but i have kind of a a unique yard and it's it's not it's sort of as wild as you can get in the city uh and so i'll sometimes i'll just go and i'll just sit on the grass underneath i have, I have one apple tree on it and i'll just sit under the apple tree for a while you know and just kind of like hang out and you notice so much of what's going on when you do that you, you, you realize what season you're in you realize what time of day it is you you hear all of these animals, these birds and different things that are actually living. And then you, you look around and you realize none of them have actually been in a building. Those birds have never been in a building. That squirrel has never been in a building. This tree will live here its entire life. What is it thinking? What is it doing? And it just it gives a very different um, hue to kind of where where do I fit into all this? You know, and what am I doing in, in my day to day life that is taking me away from a lot of this natural rhythm that's going to go on once I'm gone anyway, you know. And um, you know, a lot of a lot of that perspective. I I've studied shamanism for years with a gentleman, Brant Secunda, and you know, he emphasizes how important it is for human beings to to stay connected with nature because that's that is our that is our nature. We're like a reflection of the outer world. It's inside of us too, you know, kind of like the world is whatever about sixty five percent water, and so is our bodies. You know, we're like a we're like a mirror. Our, our our salt content is about like that of the ocean. You know, we're just part of this whole thing. And it's easy to forget that and to have our entire universe be in this little rectangular box called a phone. You know, that's what that's right. our entire thing right there. No, there's more than that. <laughs> I'm trying to find this guy. Um, I had him on the show. Talk about a great guy. Um, let me see if I could find this really fast. If not, I'm, I'm going to tell you the story anyway. Uh, yeah, Colin O'Brady was the guy's name. Do you, are you familiar with Colin O'Brady? No, I'm not. You might remember a couple of years ago, two guys took off to set the new world record to walk across Antarctica, you know, just mm -hmm. the whole way. And uh, one was a British guy and this other guy, Colin O'Brady um, from the United States, they take off around the same time. And the media picked it up because these two guys were, you know, going neck and neck and it made for a great story. And um, Colin, does a thing where every day the, the British guy is trying to psych him out a little bit, kind of like you and Dave Scott back in the mm -hmm. day. I'm sure there was some talking going on at the beginning of those runs after the 
112 mile bike. Well, the kid finally said to or Colin O'Brady says to the other guy, he goes, listen, I don't mind walking next to you, but I don't want to talk anymore. <laughs> so that's not the, so they would walk in silence. And as it turns out, O'Brady actually got there first, right? He, he got there by a couple of days, but he realized that he was walking for 12 hours a day and not talking to anyone. And it opened his mind up. You were talking about working with shamans and, and the whole deal, which is something I've always been interested in, but always too shy. I don't know if you call it shy or just too closed minded to get there. And I've always wanted to get there. But this guy's talking about just walking and just letting your thoughts take over. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book called The 12 Hour Walk, where he's encouraging people to just go out, walk out of your front door, don't think about it, and just walk for 12 hours. If that means walking around the city block for 12 hours, or walking somewhere else or whatever, just 12 hours. So I heard about this before I even had him on the show. Or did I have him on the show first? And anyway, right, <clears throat> I walked out of my door the next morning at seven o'clock, I made up three rules. Rule number one, I'm not coming back until 7pm. Rule number two, no electronics whatsoever. Mm. My phone was turned off in my backpack in case something happened to me. My wife would know where to find me, that type of thing. Yeah. You know, rule number three, I carried a pen and paper. So if I had any thoughts of things I wanted to do, I wrote them down, right? That was all of the rules. I had just moved to this area, Charlottesville, right before the pandemic. I didn't even know how to get around town. I didn't even know the town I was living in. I walked, I think, 37 miles that day mm -hmm. and never saw the same street twice except for the street coming back to my house, right? I got lost in every community. I got lost in community where there were homeless people. I got lost in, in low rent communities. I got lost in very wealthy communities. I learned about the town I was in and never spoke to anyone all day and never sat down once. Just walk. I encourage everyone to do something like that because it opened up my mind to a new level and made me think about maybe I should do some transcendental meditation. Maybe I should do that thing in my backyard where I just set up a tent and live in my backyard, right? Maybe I should do some of it because being in the house is not making me any happier. I was happier when I was walking. What say you? You ever have these kinds of things? Yeah, you know, I, I think some of it is like, um, I think people, I, I personally know that I need time throughout the day where I just am kind of like daydreaming, where I'm not, I'm not focused on a task. I'm not trying to find an answer to anything. I'm, I'm just being, I'm just existing. And I, and it, it always has to be outside because inside is a different story. And when I do that, it feels like I um, refresh my brain. It feels like it refreshes something deep inside of me that that doesn't doesn't get regenerated when I'm just focused all the time or when I'm inside all the time. And um, you know that that I've read studies about how uh, the creative problem solving part of our brain is working at peak capacity when we're actually when we're daydreaming. It's not working at peak capacity when we're focused on the task that we're trying to solve. And, you know, Einstein said some of his greatest insights came when he was riding a bike, not when he was at the chalkboard, but when he was like kind of daydreaming. And, and I, I think that's an aspect to recovery and regeneration and health that is not ever really addressed very much. Of course, everybody knows you got to get sleep at night, but right. I think it's also important, like you had on that 12 hour walk, you, you had a like a supercharged kind of daydreaming event in that you weren't out there trying to get the answer to anything, but probably a lot of stuff came to you and, and a lot of experience came to you that you never get otherwise. So I think that's an important part of the whole health puzzle and, and mental health puzzle and feeling good about life puzzle that, that if people incorporated that, like you said, go outside and walk for a little bit. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. We're going to do a quick ad here, Mark. And then um, I want to play something for you because you and I were talking about something before we turn the mics on. It reminded me of something. And I, I want to go down that road. Uh, but before we do that, I need to tell everyone about Villa Capelli olive oil, Villa Capelli. Yep. We've been talking about this company since pretty much day one of this podcast. I mean, we started talking about it because I would do three of these in a row, somewhere around the third podcast, I would yell into the mic so much that my throat would start to get sore. And I would just go get a little shot glass of olive oil and start sipping on it in the third show. We started talking about this olive oil, Villa Capelli. They started selling out in the United States as a small company. So what did we do? Well, we didn't do anything. Mr. Capelli, Paul Capelli, called us and said, hey, we want to sponsor your show. And they became our first sponsor. Villa Capelli olive oil, 
oil. It's the best olive oil on the planet. You want to save 10%, put in promo code Vinny. I tell everyone, get the three liter 10. Don't mess around with the 750 milliliters. You're going to run out. We sell them out in the United States. Get the big three liter 10. I know it's more expensive, but it's cheaper when you buy in volume and you get that 10% discount. And of course, if you somehow spend over $145 after the discount, you'll still be above $125 and they'll give you free shipping. And that's not nothing, folks. So you can get 10% off and free shipping. Go shop Villa Capelli Olive Oil. Let them know we sent you. Promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y, 10% off. <laughs> We're talking to, um, I do that like I'm reading it off a piece of paper, right, Mark? Yeah, I love that. No no wimpy Y. <laughs> no wimpy Y. You know, I started saying that and that caught on. That's the thing that caught on because people would still put the Y in and they would go, hey, I didn't get the discount. It's like, mm -hmm. got my name wrong. So mm -hmm. we got to tell them, hey, don't. Don't make Vinny sound like a female Vinny. Make it sound like a male Vinny with the IE. Right. Um, tell me if you can hear this. You and I were talking about stuff before we got rolling here. And um, let's see if I can play this. I'll play a little bit of it until it makes sense. The late, great George Collins. Uh, talking mm -hmm. about, you, know, you and I were talking about that a little bit off the air. And uh, you reminded me, it's George Carlin did a whole routine stuff. Mm -hmm. But isn't that really the truth, right? We were talking, we passed by the guy doing the gardening to go work out somewhere else where we're not getting paid. We're, we're paying this guy so we could go pay another guy. To do. It's the same thing with stuff, right? I mean, isn't it the same deal? Yeah, you know, I was I was commenting that earlier that uh, I was watching television the other day and, you know, obviously commercials and every commercial was trying to get you to buy something. And I thought, is that what humanity has been reduced to? Having this vast importance on what we can buy and buying the right thing and getting the right stuff and... And then it got me really re reflecting, like, what do what what brings me fulfillment? Has there ever been anything that I have purchased that has been fulfilling? Yeah, you get a new car, it's nice. You get a new pair of pants, it's nice. But ultimately, the things that are truly, truly fulfilling for me and the things that I have a quest to accumulate are are those experiences that I have to earn. You know, you, you have to earn you have to earn that the, the effect of that 12 hour walk. You can't just purchase it. You've got to go out and actually do it. You've got to purchase, you, you've got to earn that walk to the top of Whitney. You know, I had to earn those Iron Man titles. I have to earn the ability to catch a wave and stand on it. I can't pay somebody and get that experience. And and ultimately those are those are the things that make life worth living, those things that, that we earn that that are memorable experiences that can't be purchased. Yes, you might need equipment, you might need to fly to a location, you know, there's stuff like that, but that doesn't give you the fulfillment. And um, is there enough emphasis on pursuing those types of fulfilling experiences? Is there enough value given to how they can positively impact our lives and the lives of others? I don't know, you know, you, you help somebody out who's in need, that's fulfilling. You can't purchase fulfillment from that person. You have to earn that fulfillment by doing something with them or for them. And, and you know, so it, I don't know, it was just a point of reflection. You know, it's funny that how watching a friggin' commercial on TV got me down that whole train of thought, but it really was, it was, it was worth taking the time to think about it. It took me a few, about a week to kind of put all that in place. Like what, 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 what brings happiness to me? You know, happiness is fulfillment. Fulfillment comes from things that I have to earn that have meaning for me. You know, something very similar happened to me a couple of years ago, about two years ago, it feels like it was yesterday now. But man, it's been two years. So I was on my spinner. And, you know, I wanted to watch something mindless and senseless on television. So I'm flipping through Amazon television. Mm -hmm. And I see because I'm going to only watch the free stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to pay a $1.99 or $2.99. Because that would feel weird when they have so much free stuff. <clears throat> so I see this movie that I remember seeing in the early 1980s, starring um, Jacqueline Bissett and Rob Lowe called Class. Remember that movie? I don't remember that one. Rob Lowe plays this, um, he's um, Andrew McCarthy's in it. It's the Brat Pack, right? And they're in this private high school together. Rob Lowe's mom is played by you know, Angela Bissett. And, um, you know, on and on and on. And I remember Rob Lowe, a high school kid, was driving a convertible red 9 11. Mm. And I remember I'm looking at the thing, it's like, wow. I remember watching that movie. I was young and I was like, one day, one day, I'm going to get myself a red 9 11. 
just yeah. like that, that thought occurred to me. And then I started thinking, wait a minute, I can probably afford a red 911 now, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I don't want to go to the dealership and buy a new one. I want to buy the one like Rob Lowe is ride, driving in this movie, right? The older one. So I'll go online and I'll look and I'm realizing these things are more expensive than the new one. Mm -hmm. But then I started looking around going, wait a minute, maybe I could get one that's in rough shape and fix it up. So I'm going for like a week every night. I have this thing in my hand while my wife is sleeping. I'm not telling her about this project yet mm -hmm. because I want to do this and then say, hey, honey, look what I just did. And I got this cool car and we could go right around this cool car. Right. So every night I'm looking and now I'm figuring out that I can probably do this. Right. I can get one, start fixing it up. And I said, like, you know what? These things are never what they are. It's going to be something else. The mechanics going to say, oh, you need a new engine. It's going to cost 20,000 here. This thing's going to cost me a fortune. But I always said I was going to get one. And then I got this sinking feeling in my soul. And I said, wait a minute, I can't get one of these because I'm not a Porsche guy. Mm. I've never been a Porsche guy. I grew up poor. Poor guys don't get Porsches. And if I get a Porsche, then what else do I have to do? Mm -hmm. Do I have to get the Porsche hat? Do, mm -hmm. do I get the Porsche jacket? Do I, God forbid, join a country club? I'm thinking of all the stuff. It's like, what are my neighbors going to think? They go, oh, Vin I live in a normal neighborhood. Mm -hmm. My neighbor, oh, look at Vinny with the Porsche, with the jacket and the hat, heading to the country club. Look at him. Look at him. He's not one of us anymore. I'm thinking of all of this stuff that's going to happen because of the one piece of stuff I want to buy. Mm -hmm. I want to. So then I sat there and started reflecting. What do I really want to do? I don't really want a Porsche. I've, I've romanced myself into thinking I wanted one. I've never actually really wanted one. What do I really want to do? And I've always said, I've always wanted to work with my hands and build something out of wood. And then I started thinking, because I'm a kayaker, I'm going to see, you know, you know, those sea kayakers, you probably see them in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. For the guys out there with those really long kayaks. Yeah. I was one of those in Santa Monica. <clears throat> so I said, you know what? I was talking to this guy, Joey Schott. When I broke my kayak, I was talking to Joey. He, he was in Richmond, 90 minutes away. And he was telling me that he's built a bunch of cedar strip kayaks. And he really knows how to build these kayaks. I wonder if I get in touch with this guy and he and I could get together. He's got all the tools. He could teach me how to do this hands on. I called Joey. He was like, absolutely. Got together every Saturday, morning, mm -hmm. every Saturday for well over a year. I made it my New Year's resolution every Saturday. And that went on for, let's see, January, January was 12 months to April. So it went on for like 16 months, 340 hours of building a cedar strip kayak. That thing sits in my garage now. I take it out on the weekend. People mm -hmm. love it. It's beautiful. You never see these type of things, right? People want to come. I didn't realize it was going to be such a draw when you go to the lawn. Everybody wants to see it and touch it and talk about it and the whole thing. But the thing they can't take away from me is all the work that went in. I know every scratch. I know everything that happened with that boat. Mm -hmm. I know exactly how it was built. I was there for every moment of it. Joey taught me everything. He did a lot of work with me because there were intricate details that a beginner can't do. But the one thing you can never take away from me is that 340 hours mm. of building that thing, right? It was like a, it was a Zen type moment that all started from watching a movie. Mm. You ever have those type of things happen to you? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I kind of I, I, I think about that and some of the stuff that I like to do, like I I love to surf, right? And so I have days where maybe I don't surf so well. And I think, oh, well, I should go buy a new board. That'll be the solution. You know, I'll get a new board. That'll help me surf better. And it's like, wait a minute. <clears throat> That's a slippery slope. You get a new board to surf better. Maybe you do surf better. And then you have another shitty day. You got to buy another board. You know, it's like it's a never ending yeah. cycle. And so it's like, well, what I have is fine. I just need to improve myself. I just need to figure out maybe something with my body, with my fitness, with my balance, with how I approach the wave, whatever it is. And, and yeah, those, and, and the thing is the, the cool thing about some of the stuff that like you did with the, the kayak, nobody will, will really understand the process you went through to make it. Nobody will understand the process. It took me to do some of the stuff that I do, but that doesn't matter. I know what goes, what has gone into some of the things that I've been able to sort of put together in, in my life, whether it's races or relationships or, you know, stuff that means nothing to anybody else. It, you know, like recently I've been actually trying to finally learn how to play guitar, which I have had for years. And 
I mess around. It has no redeeming quality in the world. It will not save starving children. You know, it's not going to, but it, there's like this, <clears throat> I think when there's a, a pursuit that we do that has a certain cr a creative element to it, um, that th there's no template on exactly how to do it or to do it the way that we're going to, it becomes something that, that is our kayak, you know, it becomes yeah. our, our one wave that we surfed last week that was just great, you know, or that one little riff that you got on your musical instrument that you've never heard before. It just came out of somewhere inside of you. And, um, you, you know, so much of that is like it, it, it applies to anything. Like you're doing any kind of exercise, you're going to find a way of moving and a rhythm that will work for your body. And when you start to get in that flow yourself, whether it's walking, running, jogging, swimming, riding a bike, you're going to find all of a sudden a rhythm where everything is like, oh, this is me. This is working great. And it's such a great feeling. And on the outside, you might look exactly like you did yesterday to everybody else, but there's something that clicks inside of you. And it's a very satisfying feeling to sort of find your your Zen flow or your your moment where it's like, cool. Yeah. You know, I you reminded me of, you know, when I was still in Southern California, you know, triathlon became such a thing by the year 2000 that a lot of my clients, you know, the wives of these guys who worked in Hollywood, they all wanted to be, as you know, most people who run triathlon are females that where the husband makes more than $200,000 a year, some crazy number like that. Mm. And all of these women want to get into triathlon. And the first thing they do is they go buy way more bike than, they, you know, than they need, you know, 12 to $14,000 bikes. And I'm like, you're just learning this, you, you went right to something that's so light, it's illegal for the Tour de France. That, that's how lights are. And then the other mistake, and, and I'm saying this, because I know there's a lot of people right now, there's a guy, um, uh, Scott King, he follows along. He's a guy that follows my uh, podcast and everything. Scott used to weigh 600 pounds. He now weighs two something something. And he started doing short distance triathlon. Mm. And then he someone gave him a bike or loaned him a bike. And he didn't even have a bike. And he's completed a few of those. And now he has a mission by 2025 to do a complete Ironman distance triathlon. Mm. And I've had conversations with him on this podcast. Guy's 300 some odd pounds down from where he was, maybe maybe more. And he goes, yeah, but I don't have a tri bike yet. And I always try to explain to him, most people who do triathlons should not have a tri bike. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, well, why are they made? And I said, because there's a race in Hawaii where they have to go into the wind. There's exactly one race that goes directly into it. What is it like the Queen K or whatever? What is it, Mark, that you guys have to? Yeah, the Queen Kahumanu Highway. It's 50, basically half the bike ride out one direction, half the bike ride back the other direction, and the wind can swirl and be in your face one minute, and the, you know, the tailwind the next, side wind blowing you all over the road. It can be very intense. Yeah, and I said that's when people started wearing using time trial bikes in that race. I said, as a matter of fact, and you can back me up on this, I said in the early days before, you know, these tri bikes were made that way, they would put a tiny wheel on the front so that they could be sloped forward a bit. Mm-hmm. I tell people they think I'm making Mark. Can you confirm that that happened? In yeah, history? there there was a number of bikes made that had you know 26 inch front, 27 in the back, so that it was yet yet more of a lower profile. And this was before that anybody figured out. Well, just stick some aero bars on there, and you get the same thing. But that's this was before aero bars. Crazy looking stuff, hard to handle, didn't steer very well, but it was definitely more aerodynamic. Yeah, and it was need it was needed for one race. As a matter of fact, most people don't know this. Arrow bars were created by Pete Pensiers in the race across America, mm. you know, and those first arrow bars, the ones he, he was an engineer, they were heavy, but the weight outweighed the fact that when you got into those plane states, he was able to be lower than everyone else. And of course they got really popular after, um, um, what's his name? Lamont beat, um, his teammate on a Sean Silize a couple of years, like a year later. Right. Yeah, you know the the aero bars had had come out around 1987 uh, in in triathlon. 1989, and the first couple of years we had them, we'd be riding along and training, and the you know pure cyclists would see us out there in Boulder, and they they go, Murr! you know, yeah. just har harassing us. And then Le Mans won the Tour de France that against Laurent Fignon in 1989. No, 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 no. You, you're wrong. He he beat his own teammate um, Bernard Aino. No, it was, it was Fignon. Fignon Are was you sure? I'm 100 positive. Fignon, Fignon was it was leading the tour. It was at, and the final stage wasn't on the Champs Elysees. It was a time trial, and Le Mans right. 
Lamont beat him by like something like his overall time was something ridiculous, like eight seconds faster or something. Lamont had arrow bars. He had an arrow helmet. Fignon was had his long flowing locks blowing in the wind. And um, after that, we never got harassed about arrow bars again. I can't, believe, I, I can't believe I'm getting that wrong because the way I heard it was, you know, they were teammates. Bernard Hainaut and Lamont were teammates and Bernard Hainaut was supposed to ride for Le Mans in that final season. And that was that eight minute, that was the eight second gap, which is something you can't make up on the last day. I remember it was the eight second gap. So it was all but in the bank. But I thought that it was Bernard Hainaut. No, let me see if I could find some. The following year, Le Mans defeated Hainaut no, to win his first tour de France. So it was it was Bernard Hainaut. No. It wasn't uh, Le Mans. It wasn't um, Laurent. All right, let's. You see, as two old guys, we're going to argue here because I, when I read something, I know it. I, I just looked it up. Okay. I want you to look uh, it up too. Le Mans finished. Uh, it, it was in 1989 Tour de France. Le Mans finished. Uh, uh, fin Fignon finished in second. Le Mans went uh, well. Anyway, he it was it was look, look it up. Le Mans finished uh, beating uh, Laurent Fignon in 1989 Tour de France. Yeah, but uh, in '87, you got to remember he beat he beat no, but they, the he hunting didn't... accident. Yeah, but uh, 1987, they weren't reusing uh, arrow bars in the tour. That was the first year that arrow bars were used in triathlon. 1989 was when it kind of they arrow bars made their their real debut in the tour in the tour on that final stage, which that year happened to be a time trial. Um, and uh, that was when two years after we started using them, finally they made their way into into the cycling world in the Tour de France. And after um, Le Mans pulled off that victory over Fignon again, 1989. Uh, yeah, th that's true. But he he won the tour in 87. And that's when he beat Aino. Oh, mm -hmm. and then he had the hunting accident. Remember, he almost killed himself. Oh, yeah, that was nuts, huh? Yeah. And then the, the same, it was almost like the same thing happened to uh, Fausto Kopi back in the day. He almost killed himself in a hunting accident. And then Jeez. don't give me a gun. <laughs> yeah, whatever you do, don't go hunting. Leave that to people like me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, look, it, it's crazy how and then remember the foil style, those Y looking bikes came out. And then they the Tour de France said, in order to be in this, you, you have a you have to have a bike that looks like a bike. Mm -hmm. so, you know, the bike had to look like a bike, right? So that whole thing started. But when I go back and tell people all the time, you're going to do better in a triathlon if you're using a regular road bike in most of these races, they think I'm a lunatic. What say you? Well, I think if you train on a on a bike with aero bars, you're you're actually going to do better in almost any race, even if you're not going that fast. Just because a couple of reasons: one, it is more aero. You're going to go a little bit faster as long as your position's right and you're comfortable and you can stay in it. And, and secondly, and, and especially in a longer race, one of the things that aero bars affords you the ability to do is to really relax your upper body. You can rest your entire upper body on your elbows on those pads instead of having to hold your upper body up on the on the handlebars. And that was kind of a, that was a big energy saver, especially like in an Ironman where you're on your bike for four and a half hours to just be able to have your upper body completely re relaxed. But a lot of people never get that comfortable position and they're constantly sitting up. So if you are sitting up all the time, better just be on a comfortable road frame. Well, the way I look at it is because I look at the people that do the race across America, they use road bikes with arrow bars. So they're slightly higher. Mm -hmm. than when people are on those just all out time trial bikes where you are almost completely flat and very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. That's the point I'm trying to make when you can get your body up, you can open up your hips just enough, you still get the comfort, you still get some of the aerodynamics, but you don't get that flat kind yeah. of hip closed down and most people don't have that flexibility. Mm. Most of these people are not Mark Allen, right? They can't get down like that. Yeah, like in general, older athletes, they need to be sitting up higher because their their glutes are tighter and they can't they can't bend over. Yeah, can't generate the power. Yeah. Well, Mark, I wish I could keep you for another hour. I'm 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 glad to have you back on. This has been great as always. Stay on. I want to say goodbye to you off the air. Uh, t tell people where they can find you. I know you do coaching. Do you do coaching online or where, where can yeah, you? Yeah, I, I actually have transferred over into a, a, a killer, uh, amazing uh, coaching website. It's called tridot, T-R-I-D-O-T.com. And um, th they actually, 
Um, anyway, I've been on there about a year. Amazing platform. I, I do all my coaching on there. Mark Allen Premium is where you can get me, you know, more in a personal relationship there, personal coaching relationship. I'm still taking people for this year. Um, it's a great platform. Check it out. Try.com. That's that's where that's my bread and butter. That's my day to day thing. Scott Zagarino, my business partner, is the one who inter- actually introduced me to, to try that. He goes, you should check this out. This is everything you've needed to be able to be effective as a coach where everybody's information uploads. I can see it daily coaching. You know, the, the calendar changes based on what they're doing. So it's really it's very dynamic. And that's that's very hard to do. Um individually without some of the, the the AI that they've incorporated into TriDot. Super cool. Check it out. Love to help people out. I love the coaching aspect. You know, I, I don't do that kind of training anymore, uh, but I tell other people how to do it so that hopefully they avoid the the mistakes that, that I made in the early years. They, they benefit from all the experience. And then also, you know, there's so much of um, the art of coaching, like just helping people through some of the mentally tough times that you can go through or the lulls or just the questions like, why am I doing this? You know, and that's what I'm there for to help them out. Folks, go learn from the best. Mark Allen, please go and check it out. Try dot Mark Allen, go check it out right now. You know what to do with me. We all go shopping on Amazon. Before you go to Amazon, go to vinnytotaries.com, click through the banner, puts a little coal on the fire, gets my train down the track. Um, but up, up, uh, what else? Oh, Debbie wants me to tell you guys about the NSNG ebook. You can get that at vinnytotterich.com. So check that out. On behalf of Mark Allen, my name is Vinnie Totterich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm. <laughs>